Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing that I get to do, and I am deeply honored that I am here with you talking about the wonderfulness that is reason, the beauty that is our community, and the kick-assery that is atheism, that is American atheism. They see us, they hear us, they know we are coming on. They cannot deny it. And um, before I get all excited about 2016, we're gonna get through this conference, but a lot of great things are happening, a lot of great things behind the scenes. And the man who is at the forefront, the guy who is in the lead, the dude with the tood, the president of American Atheist, David Silverman, is gonna come up here and talk about why it's so important that you are here and what the future holds. So uh, David, come on up. You may know this as the guy with that face, Bill O'Reilly's best friend, somebody who's a lot of fun to play cards against humanity with, Cranston, New Jersey, David Silverman. Mm. Jamila Bay, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Oh look, there's chocolate and caramel back here. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. No, 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 no. What are we, Unitarians? Good morning, everybody. That's the way we do it here. My name is David Silverman, President of American Atheists, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the 41st Annual National Convention of American Atheists in beautiful Memphis, Tennessee. We are here to have fun, and it has already begun, as we all saw last night. So I want to get uh, just a few things out of the way. I always start the same way, so let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your hand if this is your first atheist event. Right, right. So let me tell you something, folks. I remember my first atheist event. I came to American Atheists because of the issues, but I stayed because of the people. So if this is your first atheist event, you owe it to yourselves to socialize, to meet the people who have been here for a while. Oh, let's see who that is. Ladies and gentlemen, raise your hand if you've been in the movement more than 10 years. Raise your hand if you've been in the movement more than 20 years. How about 30? Yeah. And it is a great time to be an American atheist, uh, to be an atheist activist because <laughs> we're about to win. It's going to be just great. <laughs> uh, I also want to take a moment to thank Sarah Green. Where are you, Sarah? Our Tennessee State Director. I also want to call out Liz Hoffmaster, the president of Memphis Atheists. If you're a Memphis local, please introduce yourselves to those two people. You need to know them because in a few days, the American Atheist Convention will be over, but the activism will hopefully continue. That's the purpose of we, the, that's the reason we bring these conventions around, to bring locals together so that when we leave, we leave behind a thriving local atheist community. I would also like to mention the rest of the atheist community. Let's see if I can get some shout outs here. Uh, first of all, my good friend Amanda Metzkis, the executive director of Camp Quest. And folks, I gotta say, I was a camp counselor at Camp Quest for seven years. Uh, I love it. If you have kids, send them to Camp Quest. And if you have time, volunteer for Camp Quest. I'm gonna also name off some more people. Don't clap until I'm done, because there's a few of them. Let's see, August Bronzman, Executive Director from the uh, Secular Student Alliance. Uh, Charlotte Shaughnessy, Executive Director from the Triangle Free Thought Society. Amy Monsky, Executive Director of Atheist Alliance International. Mohammed Sayed, Executive Director of the Ex-Muslims of North America. Lee Moore, Executive Director of We Are Atheism. Kelly Damaro, Executive Director of the Secular Coalition for America. 
Bishop McNeil from the Center of Free Thought Action. Stand up, folks. Edwina Rogers from the Secular Policy Institute, Deb Goddard from CFI, Margaret Downey from the Free Thought Society, Mandisa Thomas from the Black Nonbelievers, Tony Pinn from the Institute of Humanist Studies, Sarah Moorhead from Recovering from Religion and the Reason Rally Coalition. We're all here because we want you to see this broad movement. This broad movement is working together to make this country better for you. We're all doing our part, and I hope you will all take the opportunity to meet all the leaders of all the organizations who come to the American Atheist Convention, the largest and greatest atheist event annually every year. Now, I wanted to give you a presentation that had some really good oomph, and I've got a great presentation, and I wanted to come up with a, a great story during title, something oomphy, you know? So I picked, let's see if I can use this. I picked, no, I can't use this. Yes, I have to turn it on first. No, it was on. <laughs> Progress report. <laughs> Ooh, how about that for a stirring title? <laughs> also known as Five Years of Dave, this is my fifth convention as president of American Atheists, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And also, what you get from supporting American Atheists is really the title because I get often asked, okay, I'm paying you 35 bucks a year, I'm paying you 1,200 bucks for a life membership, what do I get for that? This is about what you get for that. And I'm gonna be giving you this progress report telling you what's been going on in the past. What was it like before I started? I'm gonna give you a five-year look back what was it like in the past? I love this little graphic. Uh, what's been going on since we took over? How has American Atheists been working since we took over? What we've been doing in the past year and why? And what the future looks like? And that's going to be what this presentation is about. Let's look at the past and see what we can remember. 2009, 2010, here are some news reports. If you just go onto Google and you look in the past and you just look at for atheist between 2009 and 2010, you will find out the great news that Brian the dog came out as an atheist on Family Guy. Uh, there was also uh, a, a movement to stop Cecil Bothwell from becoming uh, a city council member because atheists weren't allowed to be city council members in North Carolina. There was um, uh, the big news back then was that atheism was a fad. Mm -hmm. That was the thing. Atheism was a fad. Everybody was talking about atheism was a fad. It was in vogue to call yourself an atheist, and people were waiting for it to end. <laughs> that ain't happening. Uh, Christians were hating on a united coalition of reason, don't believe in God, you're not alone billboard, because that was discriminatory against Christians. That was discriminatory against Christians, so they protested the billboards. Uh, and Obama, he was worse than a Muslim, he was an atheist. Uh, you have to remember, it was a, it was a very, very interesting time, and it's, and it's interesting as I look back to see how many things have changed. Um, I'll give you another thing. Uh, AA Khan had 300 attendees in 2010. We had 300 attendees. And I will tell you what, folks, in, I was there for that. And uh, actually, if we, if we go back to the 1996, 1997 era, my first convention was in uh, New Jersey. And the then president had to find a hotel that would allow us to come. We had to find a hotel that would allow us to come to pay retail. And when you walked into the hotel, there was a board saying what was in the hotel, and they listed us as AA. <laughs> and when you called the hotel to say, hey, is your convention, is there an atheist convention there? They would say, no. That's what happened, that's where I started. And AA Con in 2010 had about 300 attendees, and just to let you know that we're in Memphis and we're here at the Peabody Hotel, which is not the Peabody Hotel, it's the Peabody Hotel. And uh, Memphis, the city of Memphis, 
flew me and Amanda Kanif out here on them, put us up in hotels, gave us nice food to solicit our vote, and we went to a whole bunch of different hotels. And when I came into the Peabody Hotel, they had welcome American atheists plastered up against the wall. But the most important thing that I remember was back in 2009 and 2010, atheism was a fringe movement. We were anything but mainstream. We were the crazy ones. We were the outliers. We were the fad. We were the temporary group, the fringe group, the hard to deal with group. And then somebody, somebody said, we cannot keep fighting defensive battle after defensive battle. We have to take the offense we must fight religion. Five brownie points to the person who can name the author of that quote. It was me. <laughs> that was my first convention speech back in Des Moines in 2011. Who was there? Rock and roll. And so, we have to talk about what we've been doing since then. We took our fight out to the, to, against religion. We decided to not just fight defensive battle, but to actually take the offense against religion and to actively try to put religion in its place, which is out of our lives and out of the American government. And we started with billboards. Billboards were fun. This was the most recent billboard. Uh, all I want for Christmas is to skip church. But of course, we started with the most famous billboard, which was, you know it's a myth, that blue billboard that was up on in front of the, the uh, Lincoln Tunnel. That was on the air, on the national news, in nine different countries. Nine different countries, including Lithuania. <laughs> but it was more than just press, more than just billboards. Those billboards led to press interviews where we got to actually explain ourselves and actually put our word out and get the word through the news. And that led to appearances. And that led to things like me being a regular on Fox News for close to a year. A regular, not just to talk, but to give the positive view on atheism. Here I am in a picture against uh, a rabbi and a Christian as equals arguing during a show. This was the first time that we were actually positioned as equals, and uh, I kept winning. <laughs> so, so they got afraid of me. <laughs> Don't forget our epic lawsuits like our ongoing fight against the IRS and the unfair tax advantages that it gives to the church and religious institutions. They put Ten Commandments up on the public lawn. We put up in, uh, monuments up on the public lawn. That's right, because we're equal and we deserve it. And we're moving on and we're getting that done in multiple states and in multiple cities across the states. We're talking about protests. We're talking about debates, lots of debates. And again, I keep winning. Uh, <laughs> um, this meme face thing happened. <laughs> And of course, a certain rally. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, we had a good time. Who was at the Reason Rally? Yeah. You all know there's going to be another one, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'll just, I mean, it's, it's public knowledge, and I'll announce it. Sarah Moorhead, are you here? Sarah Moorhead, are you here? She's in the exhibit hall. When you go down to the exhibit hall, go see Sarah Moorhead. She is the new president of, America, uh, of the of Reason Rally Coalition. Uh, I stand behind her completely. She is going to be awesome. And our own Jamila Bay is the vice president of the Reason Rally Coalition. Reason Rally 2 will be coming up in 2016 in Washington in the spring. Stay tuned for more information. And by the way, be there. Because this, this picture that you see, this was the largest atheist event in world history. That's 30,000 people in the rain, at least. Now, one of the things that American Atheists does is promote atheism anywhere and anyhow. 
And we do it by name. We do it by the word atheist. And I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about why it's so important that we address atheism as atheism. Now, this is new data. I love data. I especially love independently obtained quantitative data, which can be, which can be defended and shown and used. This is new data. This was provided by uh, Todd Stiefel from the Openly Secular Organization and the Stiefel Free Thought Foundation. Todd, are you here? No, he's also down in the exhibit hall. So he did a survey, they did a survey, and again, this is statistically significant survey. This is quantitative information. This is usable information. And this was independently offered, not from me. And according to this data, We've got two blocks here. If you're looking at atheist, we've got two blocks. The first block is people who are unfamiliar with the term. According to the data, 10% of America does not know what an atheist is. They've never heard the word. Okay. Another 3% have heard the word, but they don't know what it means. Another 3% have heard the word, but don't know what it means. And that means that when you communicate and you say that you're an atheist, 87% of the country will have a very good idea of what you're talking about. They may not have a nuanced idea. They may think it's, I don't believe in God versus I don't believe in any God versus I don't believe in an afterlife, but they get the gist of what you're saying 87% of the time. Not bad. Let's look at agnostic. Agnostic is not what you would expect. A lot of people think everybody knows what an agnostic is. That ain't the case. In fact, almost 20% are completely unfamiliar with the term. Another 20% have heard the term, but don't know what it means. And you'll notice that third box, another 10% think they know what it means, but they're wrong. In other words, they have a definition which is non-atheistic. They don't think an atheist, has, an agnostic, has anything to do with a lack of belief in a god. They think it's something else. So when you call somebody, when you tell somebody that you're an agnostic, you've got a 50-50 chance of miscommunicating. You've got a 50-50 chance that they're going to get it wrong. Let's look at another one. Let's look at secular a little bit more. More people don't understand secular. In fact, you're looking at about 65% of the people. When you call yourself secular, they don't know what you mean. They don't know what you mean. And of course, the purpose of talking, the purpose of words is to communicate. And if we're going to be activists, we need to learn how to communicate. Now we've got two more terms here, folks. We've got two more terms here, humanist and free thinker. And I'm going to show you both of them at the same time. And I want you to understand what this data shows you. Because what you'll see is that very, very few people know what you're talking about when you call yourself a humanist or a free thinker. I'm talking 90% get it wrong. 90% get it wrong when you call yourself a humanist. Now I'm not talking about those people who call themselves I'm a humanist and an atheist. That's communication. That's fine as far as I'm concerned. But if you've got a term, if somebody asks you what your religion is, and you call yourself a free thinker or you call yourself a humanist, there's a 90% chance that they're going to not associate you with atheism, which means, as we all know, they're probably going to associate you with theism. You may be using the right words. You may be using true words. But are you communicating truthfully? Are you communicating at all? Or are you just answering with something that they won't understand at all. This is important because when I tell people that they need to call themselves atheists, there's a reason behind it because we're here to be understood. Let me ask you a question. If you were religion, if you are religion, what term would you want the atheists to self-identify with? Probably the one that confuses the heck out of everybody who's not like you, right? Probably the one that doesn't convey the clearness. 
you would probably want the one that's got a 90% chance of being wrong as opposed to the one that's got an 87% chance of being right. Now, people have chided me for saying you should call yourself an atheist. They say I'm trying to dictate, trying to have a dogma. This is not dogma, folks. This is strategy. This is basic strategy. And I'll tell you what else it is, folks. It's humanism. It's humanism. Because I'm a humanist. I'm a humanist, and I care. Who do I care about? I care about a whole bunch of people, but I care about those people who can't come out. I care about those people who can't come out because they're stuck in a religious environment, because they're kids with religious parents, because they're people with religious bosses who can't come out of the closet. I care about them. That's why we're here. That's one of the reasons why we're here. I mean, we're not here spinning our wheels. We're here to help people, right? If we are here, if we care about them, if we care about the bigotry, the people who are stuck in the closet, we care about the fact that they're stuck in the closet due to bigotry. Therefore, we want to defeat the bigotry. That's what we're doing. We want to defeat the bigotry by fighting the bigotry. What fuels bigotry? Ignorance. How do you fix ignorance? Communication. Communication. How do you fight effectively? You use the correct word, the word that's understood by almost 90% of the population. Yes, it's good strategy, but I ask you, I plead with you, in the name of humanism, call yourselves atheists. <laughs> atheism in a conversation is extremely important. And this chart is a very important, more data. Here's, I just love data. Now, this is extremely important. If we're going to have a conversation about atheism and fight the bigotry, fight the, the, fight the bigotry that holds us down and holds our, our fellow atheists down, we need to increase the use of the word so that people will have the word de-demonized. So that when somebody comes out as an atheist, they are not the first person to, per, to the people that they're talking to who, is, who has done so. They're not the first. We need to blaze that trail. That's what American Atheist does. So I got a chart here. Some of you have seen it before, and uh, I'm just going to go over it quickly. Uh, we've got a little addition to it. The blue line that you see in front of you is number of searches for the word atheist in Google in a month the number of searches for the word atheist in Google in a month. And it goes up and down for a very good reason. Something happens to cause people to look it up. A news event happens and people look it up. When there are no news events, it goes down. It goes down to that red line, which is what I represent as a floor. Now, that floor is what I represent to be a measurement, a barometer of atheist normalcy. This is how many times people are looking up the word atheist without being pushed to do so, just on a normal, regular, day-to-day -day basis. When there's no news items, how many people are looking it up? And you see what happens here. In late 06, early 07, the God delusion, letter to a Christian nation, and God is not great, came out, and they all went out, and they all did book tours, and they all went on TV, and maybe coincidentally, but probably not, there was a huge spike after that. And look, people started to use the word atheist more regularly since then. The floor raised. The floor raised. And then time went on, and you'll see that there's a, uh, you'll notice that there's a spike at 06 and a spike at 07 and a spike at 08. That's uh, the Christmas spike. That's what I call the O'Reilly factor. That's when they all complain about the war on Christmas and everybody says, let's look up those atheists, what they're doing. But as you see, in Christmas of 08, around Christmas of 08, uh, Richard Dawkins put up those ads in England and it caused world news. It was all over the, the American news. You know, don't believe in God or uh, 
stop, there's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. Ooh, crazy, crazy stuff. Crazy, hardline. Yeah, that Richard, he's really hard-nosed. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Don't heckle me, please. <laughs> now, my point is that the ads caused a rise in the floor. And the rise in the floor was permanent. Even though it happened in England, it affected us. These, this data is for American only. Now, you'll see that little clip there at the end. That is uh, September of 2010. If you look up atheist in September of 2010, you'll see two things happening. Number one, the Pew Research came out and said atheists know more about religion than religious people do. <laughs> Not news. And of course, far more importantly, I was elected president of American atheists. <laughs> so here's what happened next. We took our offensive and we made some things happen. We pushed the envelope. And if you look closely, every single or almost every single one of those peaks coincides with American atheist publicity and activity. Almost every peak. A very strong correlation. Now, a couple of interesting things here. If you notice, first of all, the number one is, of course, the Reason Rally. I love that. Uh, if you look at the, uh, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, Christmas 11 is followed by the myth billboard. You see the myth billboard out there? That's the first time that there is not a huge dip after Christmas. And that is because uh, we put up that billboard. Now, the thing about it is that in that month, and in the month with the Christian and Muslim billboards, the Christian and Mormon billboards, there was no other atheist activity that month at all which gives credence to the idea that these peaks are being caused only by American atheist activity. Okay, because the peaks are just as high. Now, I'm going to, now, now for those of you who aren't familiar with this chart, I'm going to tell you to look up online because there are lots of charts that back up this data. And I'm not going to get into that now. That's a different presentation. It's called Firebrand Atheism for the Win. And if you look at that chart, or if you read my book, there's going to be a lot of data in there that talks about, that backs this data up. Now, here's some interesting update. If we look more recently, we see the floor breaks. The floor breaks. And that break coincides perfectly with a lack of publicity from American atheists. And that means that not only are we driving the conversation, we are the conversation. Or we are making the conversation happening. And the conversation suffers when we go silent. An interesting thing. Now, fortunately, it, rever it, it went back up. When we launched Atheist TV, when we had our convention in, Fort, in, in Salt Lake City, the normalcy went up. But the point about this is that all of this conversation seems to be very driven by American atheist activity. Of course, correlation is not causation, but I've got tons of correlation that I can show you here that makes it look very strongly like American atheists is single-handedly driving the conversation about atheism in America. So let's talk about how we're driving it with what we did in the past year. You know, we launched a television network. Yeah. We launched the first ever atheist television network. And let me tell you a little bit about it. It's on the Roku channel. We originally expected this to pull down a terabyte of data a month. That's our demand. We budgeted for a terabyte of data a month. That's how, we, that's how you rate a Roku channel, how much you pull down, how much demand there is for your data, how much demand there is for your content. We expected a terabyte a month. We got 31 terabytes in the first week. In the first week. We were hoping for 2,500 subscribers. 
and we have just passed 27,000 subscribers. This is the kind of drive we're seeing. We've got participation of Atheist TV as a broad thing. It's a movement-oriented thing. So we've got participation from multiple orgs, including the SSA, the Richard Dawkins Foundation, and vloggers like Aaron Ra and Christina Rod. Uh, we're very, very proud of the fact that we also can list, of course, the Reason Rally and the Conventions 14 and this convention, for those of you who want to know, will be aired entirely on Atheist TV for free for your viewing pleasure and all you need is a Roku box. It's all free. And this is something that we're doing. Why are we doing this? Because we have to go where we are not. And we were not on television. There were thousands, thousands of religious networks on television and no atheist television, none. So now we have something. It's not Netflix quite yet, but it will be, well, maybe. But the point is that all around the world right now, there are 10 million people who can access atheist television, atheist-themed television, comedy, discussion, drama, all online, all for free, in their living room for the first time ever because of American atheists. And coming soon, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Whoa. I love doing that stuff. <laughs> Another thing that we did this past year was something very important called Atheist Voter. And if you look in the other room, we have Atheist Voter t-shirts for sale. Atheist Voter was a, much more than a hashtag. It was a coordinated movement-wide event where we tried to get people to tag themselves as Atheist Voters and tweet their congressmen tweet their candidates and ask for responses. The idea was to highlight atheists as a voting block. And it's about frickin' time, don't you think? It's about time we're a voting block. It's about time we're recognized as such. <clears throat> it attempts to get recognition from candidates, specifically to and for atheists. Because guess what? To, to the best of my knowledge, to the best of anything that we can find, before atheist voter, not a single candidate had overtly asked for an atheist vote. Not a single candidate, as far as I know, had asked for an atheist vote at the national level. Not one. This time, we got one. Senator Cory Booker went way out of his way to respond to atheist voter tweets. Now, yes, Senator Cory Booker was, is my senator, and I'm very happy about it, but the important thing is, and I want you to see this, the veil has been pierced, okay? The first one is the hardest. He solicited our vote openly and proudly. He got reelected. He did not face any backlash, none. What does that mean for next time? What does that mean for 2016? That means we can use him as an example. We can show that you can actively, positively solicit your vote and get the atheist vote, get the fastest growing religious demographic voting for you because you simply ask for it and win and face no backlash. We're going to leverage this in 2016 for more and more. We are going, we pierced the veil, and from here it's going to get easier. And thanks to Cory Booker for making that happen. Now, let's talk about my friend. <laughs> oh, you laugh. I, I gotta tell you, I like me some Sarah. I, I like Sarah, I like Phil, and I like Ted. <laughs> because they all have something in common. Please do not. <laughs> they all have something in common. We can use them to our advantage. And that's exactly what we're doing when we go to CPAC. When we go to CPAC, we have a very specific agenda. And that is to use those folks to our advantage. We have to go, of course, where we are not. And what was the conservative movement? The conservative movement was known 
as a place for Christians who are Christians and Christians only for Jesus. And that is an incorrect assumption, ladies and gentlemen. We know that this is an incorrect assumption because we went there. We went there and the first thing that we tried to do, well, mainly because we wanted to highlight the fact that Christianity and conservatism are not synonyms, that you can be a conservative and not Christian. It's more than that, though. We were raising the awareness that the theocratic side of conservatism is not conservative at all and is actually holding back real conservatism. Now, yeah. Now, folks, a lot of people have the exact wrong idea about this. They think we went to highlight, to, to try and recruit anti-abortionists, anti-gay rights, anti-death with dignity assholes to the movement. That's not the case because that's not what is in conservatism, okay? The atheists in conservatism, simply, they agree with us, they agree with the liberal social agenda for the most part, they just don't place it high on their priority list, they place others high on that priority, priority list. So if we go in there and we kind of elevate that and we show them that they're being made fools of by the religious right, they can see it. We can show them that the path to truly compassionate conservatism is religion free. That it's not compassionate when, you're, when your religion, when you use the law to push your religion on someone else and stop them from marrying or, or, or invade somebody's bodily autonomy or stop somebody. I mean, how in your world can you call it compassionate when you won't let somebody who's in pain and dying to end his life in his own way? That's not compassionate. And the points stick, ladies and gentlemen. They get it. They get it. You say to them, you know what? Sarah Palin wrote on her hand. They say, I know. <laughs> they do. They're embarrassed by that wing. They're embarrassed by it and they're ashamed of it. And we're there to stoke that. We're there to stir that pot, to get them complaining that this is conservatism. This is not church. This is not church, and we do not have to, or they do not have to, lower themselves to getting somebody unintelligent, unaware, just so that they can get somebody who believes in an invisible man in the sky. That sticks. And this is a very big picture effort. I want you to understand this. If we can succeed, this is a big deal. This is a big goal. But if we can so dissent between conservatism and Christianity, if we can actually get conservatism to separate from Christianity, like it was back in the days of Barry Goldwater, we win. We win. We're done. This is a huge picture effort, and I hope that you all see this, because this is how we spread compassion, this is how we spread secularism, and this is how we fix our country, and this is how we protect separation of church and state. We're taking a sword to the jugular of the, of the Christian conservative movement, of the Christian movement, because they get all their power and all their might, and they are vulnerable, ladies and gentlemen. They are vulnerable inside conservatism. We went in there with two bags full, two gallon bags full of buttons that said conservative atheist, and we ran out. Now, last year, we went, and they did not allow us in. We, all right, we bought our booth, and then they said, the atheists are coming, and they took our booth away. So we did the only thing that we could do, which was go pay full retail for a ticket and hand out, uh, hand out flyers. Now, this is a cool picture. I'm going to show you what this picture is. So I want you to picture, see that left ledge there on the left-hand side of the screen? That is the front of a huge auditorium that goes all the way back to those back windows. It's huge. It's a 10,000 person auditorium. The entire auditorium lets out into that hall. And what you're seeing there, those people that are coming toward me, is the leading edge of 10,000 conservatives fresh out of a Sarah Palin talk. 
and I'm standing there with atheist brochures. I got my Firebrand Atheist shirt here, I got pins and buttons everywhere, and I'm saying, why are the atheists at CPAC? Why, do conserv why should conservatives care about atheism? And they started to walk by me. And then they turned around, ladies and gentlemen. They turned around to talk to me. They turned around to take the brochures. Because guess what's at CPAC? Lots and lots of atheists. Lots and lots of atheists, most of whom who are really sick of the social conservative agenda, but they bite the bullet because they don't think it's high enough on their personal priority list over other issues. They're sick and tired of Sarah Palin writing on her, writing on her palm and not reading any newspapers. They're tired of it. They're intelligent. They care about marriage equality. They care about choice. They care about death with dignity, but they don't care enough. So we're there to raise that profile. And we gave out tons of pins and tons of flyers and told them to give the feedback form to CPAC. Make sure that CPAC knows that you're an atheist. Make sure that CPAC knows that you support the atheists having a place at the table. And this year, we got our table. That's right. In fact, we got a great table, and we listed it all off with, we, 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 you can see the buttons that are there. Uh, we ran out of buttons, and we signed up lots of members, and it was really a, a fantastically rewarding experience. You would expect that we would have been surrounded by Christians yelling at us about Jesus. That happened a couple times, but for the most part, for the most part, we were welcomed because for the most part, there's a lot of atheists at CPAC, way more than we expected way more. And that's fertile ground to sow dissent. One of the things that we also got this year was a speech by the lovely Jamila Bay, who took the stage. Who took the stage at CPAC to talk positively about atheism at CPAC. And you know, there was an article about the golf clapping she, she, she re received, and yeah, she did receive golf clapping. But I'll tell you something that was very interesting, because if you watch the video of her speech, the, the, the clapping is very, very yay. But guess what? All weekend long, people were coming by our booth telling her how awesome she was. People are afraid to applaud. People are afraid to support. They need the push. They need the effort, but they re really liked our presence. They appreciated our presence. They called us heroes for going in there and championing the separation of religion and government where the separation of religion and government has been almost totally dismissed as something bad. This is why we're there. And what did we get when we were there? We got members. Yeah, that was nice. We made about 100 members. Very good. We got about, a, about, yeah, that's good. But more importantly was that visibility. Because we gave away all those pins, all those buttons with a caveat. Yes, you can have all the buttons you like as long as you wear them. Yes, you can have all the buttons you like as long as you wear them. And they said, sure. And they wore their buttons. And so we had a bunch of people, a huge bunch of people, scores and scores of people walking around CPAC wearing conservative atheist buttons. Conservative atheist buttons. The conversation had started. Let's look at the conversation because we had some conversation. Here are some headlines following CPAC. Now the first time we went to CPAC we had a lot of headlines too. And that headline, those headlines were atheists were there. Okay. Now look at these headlines. Young conservative and atheist, a test for the GOP from the Christian Science Monitor. Should an atheist ever be a Republican from Chicago now? Not all conservative Republicans are Christian from World Religion News. Conservative evangel evangelicals dominate the base of Republican Party. Is there room for non-believers too from the Daily Beast? Want to restore morality? Encourage atheism. 
from the Baltimore Sun. Jamila Bay becomes the first atheist activist to address CPAC from the Black Christian News. Like I said, last year, the first time when we went, it was all about the atheists dared to be there. Ladies and gentlemen, these all are about our inclusion. These are all the discussion about our inclusion, atheists included in CPAC. This is so important. Look at this next one, my favorite. Yes, there are those who may choose to be non-religious, and that's fine, and the conservative movement is broad enough for them. From Tony Perkins. Now please, ladies and gentlemen, get me straight. I'm not all happy that Tony Perkins likes us. <laughs> but I am thrilled that he thought it was important for him to say it. I am thrilled that he said that on a panel, and the other people on that panel knew they could not disagree. They did not fight it. This is infiltration, ladies and gentlemen. This is how we do it. We take away the power. See this? You see this? This is how we take over American politics, or at least take over some semblance of separation of religion and government in conservatism. We are in there now. We are forcing the conversation. If we are forcing the conversation, they can't say, well, atheists are included, and Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They can't, because it makes them sound like the hypocrites that they all are. So, or at least like Tony Perkins is. So, I mean, he, you should see the video. He chokes on those words. <laughs> he chokes on those words. But he had to say it. He knew he had to say it because his audience was peppered with people with conservative atheist buttons. He saw us. They see us. They know we're there. And they are going to know we're there forever. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is an exciting time because we are not just Brian now. <laughs> it has been five years since we started this attack on religion, and now Religion News Service has an atheism reporter. That's a good thing. That's a little old news. It happened a couple years ago, but it's still there. Atheist billboards are common. They're accepted, mostly, and they're never protested. Nobody protests billboards anymore because it's common, because atheists do that. We're a part of society. We're going to do that. CNN did that great thing, that, uh, that great documentary. Now, I'm not saying that documentary was perfect. I have some qualms about it. I wish there was more diversity. I wish they hadn't cut and pasted me a little so, so much. I wish they hadn't frank and spliced what I'd said so much. But let me tell you something about that CNN documentary. Did you notice that there was something very important missing from it? A religious point of view. They didn't bring in a preacher to say that anything. They didn't bring in a priest. Nobody was wearing a collar. Atheists were painted as the good guys. Religionists were painted as the bad guys. And there was nothing to compensate around that. Yes. And that was followed up by several articles and, several, and even an op-ed where they let us expand on our views. This is all on CNN, and this is just one thing. CBS is coming up, I believe, next, next month. There's a lot that's happening in the press, and I want you to understand something. The press is not active. The press is not an activist thing. It's reflective. They're in this for the money. They do things for the money. Everything the press does is for the money. Everything the press does is for the ratings. If they put on a documentary like this, they didn't do it to change the world. They did it because they recognize that the world is changing. They did it because they see us. They did it because they see all of us. And they know that we're relevant, and they know that we're growing, and they know that we're the fastest growing in all religious, in, all, in, all, in every state. And they know that religion is shrinking, and they showed a positive thing about us for an entire hour as a special report. No, it wasn't perfect, but it was the first. And for the first, I think it was great and a great sign of the success that we're having on a national level.
speaking of a national level, every poll shows atheism rising. Every poll shows re religious affiliation is shrinking. All of them. They're all shrinking. They're, they're all consistent. We are making a difference. By causing the conversation to happen, we are de-demonizing the word and making atheism more acceptable on a national scale. This is what we at American Atheists do. We are no longer a fad. Have you noticed that? Nobody thinks we're a fad. Nobody thinks we're a fringe. Everybody knows that atheists are here, atheists are a part of the community, and atheists are here to stay. And that is what we're going for at American Atheists. So, yeah. So here's what's next. Number one. Oh, look, an announcement. I mentioned Atheist TV was uh, available on um, Roku, and now I'm happy to announce that Atheist TV will be expanding in the near term to Amazon Fire, which should quadruple our exposure to the world, which is going to be great. Uh, coming up later on this month, or later on this summer rather, is the first ever atheist convention in Puerto Rico. Folks, you've got to come to that. <laughs> We've got a great hotel with an infinity pool. Let me tell you what happens in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is like the Bible Belt on steroids. Okay, we're talking about on-duty cops being instructed and doing this. They actually pull cars, o cars over. They set up blockades and pull cars over so that Christian preachers can hand out pamphlets. This is happening. This is where atheism is not. And this is why American Atheists is bringing the first ever atheist convention to the island of Puerto Rico later on this summer. We're going to do there what we're doing here, which is leaving behind a stronger, more motivated, hopefully self-sustaining atheist presence in the city of Puerto Rico, in the city of San Juan. CPAC, yeah, you know what? It's expanding because there's so much fertile ground there. There's so much room to spread the word that compassion comes from secularism. There's so much room to expand the fact. I mean, wouldn't it be great? Just, just think about this. I mean, just think about this. Picture yourself having a choice at the voting booth. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Crazy. The, uh, imagine not voting to preserve the separation of church and state as the only issue. Just think about that. Think about having two candidates that actually support your right to live as a free and equal in society. This is what we're going for. This is what we're doing. And this is how we're going to do it. And guess what? I think we can do it. From all of the atheists that we're seeing at CPAC, from all of the response that we're getting, and from the conversation that did start on stage and in the papers, I'm telling you, I think we can do this. I think we can beat this. I think we can separate conservatism from Christianity and win this war once and for all. Another part of that will be an expansion of Atheist Voter. Atheist Voter will grow in preparation for 2016. Again, Atheist Voter is non-branded from American Atheists. We're sponsoring it, but we're not branding it. It's not about us. We have a separate website, and we're hoping that more organizations will participate in it just to get people to tweet to their candidates with an Atheist Voter hashtag to say, hey, I'm an Atheist Voter. Do you want my vote? Hey, I'm an Atheist Voter. Tell me about your position on church and state. Get them to solicit the votes back. I hope that I can depend on all of you to do this in 2016. Now, I want to tell you personally that I did it, and not only did Cory Booker respond to me, but so did two of the people running on my local city council. They both solicited my vote, and they both won. And that's, this is the key. This is how we pierce the veil. This is how we change the country. We show that it can be done. We show that you can do it and still win and not face any backlash. So what that's going to mean is that next time we can use that as an example to get more. And that's how we achieve more atheist normalcy for this entire country. 
Reason Rally 2, also happening in 2016. Y'all gonna be there? Y'all gonna be there? Reason, uh, Sarah Moorhead, I cannot tell you how much I, uh, I'm really looking forward to what she does. Uh, I completely uh, support her and Jamila, of course. Um, it's going to be a great event. I'm still involved. I'm in the back room. I'm on a couple of committees. I'm doing my thing. But this is all about them, and frankly, this is uh, a very important thing that you have to understand. Reason Rally is, was not an American Atheist event. It was a movement event. It's got to stay a movement event. That's why I'm not doing it a second time, because if I'd done it the second time, it would have been an athe American Atheist event. So now we've moved on. I've handed it off, and Reason Rally 2 is going to be fantastic, and I hope you all come. Now, what this does mean is that we're breaking from tradition because next year we will not have a national convention on Easter weekend. We will not be having a national convention uh, in the spring at all. We do not want to cannibalize Reason Rally. We want everybody to go to the Reason Rally and have a good time. Uh, American Atheists will be doing something very, very cool, pun intended, at, uh, in, um, in 2016, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Okay, because we haven't signed any papers yet, and when we haven't signed any papers, if I revealed what I want to do and we haven't signed papers, we lose leverage. So I'm not going to tell you what it is. Just keep your eye on us, and we'll let you know what it is as soon as papers are signed. Uh, oh, and there's one more thing, future. Got to say this. My book is finally coming out. So just to tell you a little bit about this, uh, some of you may remember that the book used to be called I Atheist, and it was about to come out two years ago, and it didn't come out. And we had a snafu with our uh, a disagreement with the publisher, so I changed publishers, and now I'm being published by uh, St. Martin's Macmillan. Uh, and they said to us, okay, Dave, we're going we're gonna to do all this stuff for you, but we get to change the title, and we get to change the cover. And I said, okay. So the name of the book is Fighting God. It is now on pre-order. There's a flyer in your booklet. Pre-order it. Uh, I got to tell you, they put me through a lot of work. It is not I Atheist. Fighting God is not I Atheist. It is a substantially better book, and I'm much more proud of it than I was for the first one. So please do that. So I mentioned before that the title of this talk was, the third title of this talk was, What Do I Get? What do I get for membership? Well, here is what you get. You get press events, which lead to publicity, which lead to a growth in normalcy for atheists. Makes sense. You get voter awareness, which leads to political relevance, which leads to a growth in normalcy, in atheist normalcy. What do you get? You get atheist TV, which leads to greater penetration of the movement's messages on a broad scale to millions and millions and millions of people worldwide, which leads to greater awareness, which leads to greater normalcy. What else do you get? A presence in the conservative movement, the elimination of a Christian-only political party, the elimination of a Christian-only political party, which yields greater awareness of atheists and the bigotry against us in the social agenda and the and the the lack of compassion in the social agenda too. And what does that lead to? More acceptance from atheists from conservatives, which leads to less Jesus from the conservative voice, which means more atheist normalcy. You see the theme. This is what we're doing. This is how American atheists is, is, is working. And this is what you get. This is what you get. Atheist normalcy on a large scale from an organization that is clearly and measurably driving the conversation. In summary, I'm pretty sure I'm running late. In summary, 15 years and counting. Again, those of you who were in Des Moines said I gave us a 20 year time frame before we would actually call ourselves normal in society. 15 years and counting, five years down, we're making good headway. We're a quarter of the way there time-wise, and we are making substantial headway in every, mem in every measure of society that we can see. We are changing this country for the better, and we can prove it. American Atheists is clearly 
driving the conversation about atheism in America. And again, we can prove it with numbers, we can prove it with articles, we can prove it with press, we can prove it with presence, we can prove it with atheist voter, we can prove it with response from politicians. We can prove that we are leading this effort. American Atheists is leading the way in multiple and new and important directions to attack religion and its undue influence on your lives, on our lives, and very importantly, on the lives of the people who cannot come out of the closet yet. We're here for them too. Don't forget that. Religion is fighting back as we knew it would, Indiana. And what are they doing? They're making themselves look awful. They're making themselves look awful. So let's just, uh, just picture yourself a conservative atheist looking at Indiana. What are you thinking right now? What are you thinking? They're thinking they're making you look like a bigot in the name of Jesus. Oh, that's something we can use, folks. That's how we're using those Sarah Palins and the Phil Robertsons to our advantage. That's how we're sowing dissent among conservatives for the betterment of conservatism and for the betterment of the United States of America. What you get from your support, from your membership, is efficient, transparent, and effective change. You are purchasing activism with your membership from the best in the business for you, your family, and your country. Remember, American Atheists is a tax-deductible organization. We are GuideStar Silver rated, and we proudly have audited financials. We spend $20,000 every year to have our financials audited by an independent firm, and we put them right up on the website, atheist.org slash financials, so you can know that your money is being spent wisely and efficiently for the betterment of this country. Because when it comes right down to it, everything that happens at American Atheists is happening because of you. Everything that happens is, is about your support. You know, I talk about American Atheists, we're doing this and we're doing that. I'm not talking about me and the staff of American Atheists. I'm not just talking about me and the staff when I say we. I'm not just talking about our awesome state directors and regional directors. I'm not just talking about our awesome volunteers. I'm not just talking about our board of directors. I'm talking about all of us because you make it happen. You are the reason that all of this is happening. If you don't support us, we stop functioning. So the idea here is I want you to leave you with a thought. We're going to win this fight, folks. We are going to succeed. And we're going to succeed in our lifetimes. Not you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to succeed in our lifetimes, and yes, possibly in Chris's lifetime. We are winning. We are making huge inroads. We're going to succeed in our lifetimes. We're going to be able to sit back when we're older in our rocking chairs and look at the country that we prepared for our children and for our grandchildren. And we're going to be able to reflect on the fact that we as a team made it happen. We as a team, changed this country for the better. Thank you. <laughs>